Hi, it's Dwyer. I'm a gambler. I run gamblersadvisory.com. I'm also a lawyer. My law firm can be found at richarddwyer.com. Later today, I'm going to prepare papers to renew a restraining order on behalf of a client. A restraining order we received a few years ago after a trial, a contested trial. Right? Part of my life is devoted to helping the victims of domestic violence. Right? Just understand my bias. I'm also a libertarian. I believe you have to watch out for abusive people, crooks, and sometimes the government. Now here online I talk about people accused of crimes. Right? At times I will find someone to be innocent. At other times I'll find someone to be guilty. For example, I personally believe, just my personal belief, that Amanda Knox was guilty. I question the innocence of Adnan Saeed. Right? I have no doubt, my own opinion, that Reuben Hurricane Carter was guilty. Right? I question whether Diane Downs should have been convicted. Let's talk about one of the most infamous crimes of the 20th century. Right? A 19-year-old, Charles Starkweather, on the run, right, in the company of the woman he loves, Carol Ann Fugate, goes on a murder spree in which 11 people are left dead. Right? Starkweather gets the electric chair. Fugate gets life imprisonment. Right? Should she have been convicted? Let's look at this from a 2015 perspective. Understand, at the time, America was outraged. Starkweather was fascinated by James Dean. He had his hair like James Dean. He always had a cigarette dangling from his mouth. Many people consider him to be America's first rock and roll spree killer. Right? This is the late 1950s in Nebraska. Now, from my limited perspective, here's what I think, and we're going to dive into the facts of this case. First, in my opinion, this is one of the biggest travesties of justice in American history. Right? The prosecutorial misconduct in my eyes, right, and this is from a Stanford Law School grad in 2015, is so egregious that it pollutes the case to such a degree that 14-year-old Carol Ann Fugate should never have been, let me repeat that, never have been convicted of murder. After the police apprehend Charles Starkweather, understand that Starkweather denied that Fugate had any involvement whatsoever in the murders. Right? Starkweather told the cops that he was responsible for every murder that was committed. Right? Since he and Fugate are the only ones present for the murders, right? The only ones who witnessed the murders. Charles Starkweather's testimony should have prevented the state from being able to mount a case in which they met the legal burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that Carol Ann Fugate was guilty of anything, right? Understand, Fugate did not have to talk with the police. Right? In America, you have what's called Fifth Amendment rights. You don't have to talk with the police to assist them in a police investigation. 
right? Charles Starkweather, after getting arrested, tells the cops multiple times that he's the one who did all of the murders. So then things get sketchy. Then the state leans on a 14-year-old to help them with the murder investigation before she is represented by counsel. They tell Carol Ann Fugate, please assist us in figuring out what happened to these murders. Knowing that Carol Ann Fugate was literally just days away from getting her court appointed lawyer. So after Fugate tells them, as she has always maintained from the moment she was arrested, right, without the assistance of a lawyer, Fugate tells authorities, you know, I was being held hostage. I was with Starkweather against my will. The prosecution asked Fugate. They asked her, knowing she's terrified of Charles Starkweather, according to her, right? They ask her to write a letter to Charles Starkweather, telling him that she never wants to see him again, right? Fugate does just that. She's 14 years old. She's not yet represented by counsel. She's writing the letter at the request of the prosecution. Well, Starkweather gets the letter. Starkweather's 19. He gets the letter from his 14-year-old ex-girlfriend. Right? And that's important here. Ex-girlfriend. Because according to Fugate, she tried to break it off with Charlie two days before the murder spree. She believes that's what prompted the murder spree. Well, Starkweather is enraged after he gets the letter. The letter the prosecution wanted Fugate to write him. Starkweather changes his story. Now Starkweather says that Fugate pulled the trigger and killed one of the people killed on the spree, right? Believe it or not, Fugate is convicted in large part based on Starkweather's changed story, right? Starkweather changes his story eight or nine times, right? Based on not Starkweather's initial versions of events that exonerate her, but based on later versions of events that he comes up with after he receives the Dear John letter that the prosecution had an unrepresented 14-year-old defendant write him. Right? Starkweather shows up at trial, right? By then, he's convicted. He's facing the death penalty. He shows up at her trial, claims that she was voluntarily a part of his murder spree, and she gets convicted. Right? That's how sketchy the conviction was. In my opinion, today, it wouldn't happen, right? Today, we would look at the defendant and say, wow, she's only 14. I believe today we have a greater appreciation and awareness of things like battered women's syndrome, right? People being afraid for their lives in the presence of killers, Right now, let's go back. Let's go back to 1956 in Nebraska. 
right? Before I do, you heard me say earlier in this video that I'm a gambler. You should know another fact about Carol Ann Fugate's murder conviction. You should know that there was a juror who was a gambler. That juror made a bet on whether Carol Ann Fugate would get the death penalty. Before he was picked as a juror in the case. Right? Understand, there are many, even this gambler, who believes that this juror, with a financial interest in the outcome of the case, should never have been allowed to serve on the jury. In a criminal case, with a possible death sentence, this juror should have been disqualified. In my opinion, any judgment rendered in which this juror was a part of the judgment and was a part of the jury deliberations should have been voided. Understand, there are independent grounds to throw out the murder conviction of Carol Ann Fugate, right? One is the prosecutorial misconduct that led to admitted killer Charles Starkweather's changed version of events, right? His testimony's tainted, right? His testimony is the result of a letter that the prosecution had Carol Ann Fugate an unrepresented 14-year-old write. But there's the second independent grounds that someone who was betting on whether Carol Ann Fugate would get the death penalty was actually one of the jurors who helped make that decision. I encourage everyone to research the facts. Now many people, and it's unsaid here, but understand it exists. Many people are alarmed at the age difference between Carol Ann Fugate and Charles Starkweather. At the time of the murders, he's 19. She's 14. What's a 14-year-old doing with a 19-year-old? That five-year age gap is huge at that age, even today. Well, understand, she met him when she was 13, and he was 18. But the key is, he was supposed to have already been vetted because she met him, at least according to reports here online like Wikipedia. She met him through her sister, Barbara, who was dating his friend. Right? In other words, she met him through people she knew. Right? I would argue when you meet someone that way, you're not going to expect that person to be Ted Bundy. You're going to think that the people introducing you to the individual are doing so because they believe in the individual. Now understand Charles Starkweather was not a ladies man. Very important. Let's profile him for a moment here. Just indulge me here. What I'm going to say is a bit controversial. Starkweather's not a ladies' man. There aren't a lot of women. In fact, there may not be any women before Carol Fugate who considered themselves to be Charles Starkweather's girlfriend. Right now, Fugate is the first woman who identifies herself as Starkweather's girlfriend. I believe Charlie Starkweather, who had a problem fitting in, right, came from a loving family but had a problem fitting in, was viewed as a little bit slow by teachers. I believe Charles Starkweather thought he met the woman of his life, right, the love of his life. Understand, Charles Starkweather was five foot three and a half inches tall. Right? Five, three and a half. 
You can imagine. He may have felt that there were a lot of women in life who were off limits to him. A lot of women won't date shorter men. Let's just be blunt here. Right, Carol Fugate was five feet one inches tall. Right, she will date him. Right? Understand how much Starkweather loved Carol Ann Fugate. They go out for about a year. Understand how much he loved her. He actually, seven weeks before killing her family, he actually goes out to buy her a gift. He's on his own. And of course, he can't afford the gift. So what does he do? He robs a gas station and kills a man. This is on his own. He's not with Fugate. This is seven weeks before killing Fugate's family. He goes out and shoots a man to death as part of a robbery so that he could afford a gift for his 14-year-old girlfriend. Right? He shoots the gas station attendant with a shotgun. It's his first known murder. It's not known at the time. The murder is unsolved in the seven weeks between when Charles Starkweather kills Robert Culver, right? And when he kills Fugate's family. Understand, before the murder spree that involves Fugate, Charles Starkweather was already a killer. Right? Let's be clear. When I said he was a killer in Fugate's presence, right? In other words, she's 14. How is she supposed to act? She senses his violence. Understand he literally killed a man before the start of the spree. Let's go a little bit deeper into Charles Stark weather. Did he kill for notoriety? I don't believe he did. There's seven weeks between his first murder and killing Fugate's family. But yet, no one knew he was the murderer. He didn't broadcast that to the world. Fugate claims she never knew he murdered a guy seven weeks earlier. Starkweather kept that a secret from even the people close to him. Now understand, he has an end game. No one talks about it. It's there. He has an end game. For the murder spree, you need to factor this into how you think about the case. His end game for the murder spree is to take the woman he loves to his brothers in Washington State. Right? It's to leave Lincoln, Nebraska and go to a different life on the West Coast, in Washington State, around a family member. That's his grand plan, right? Everything done is in furtherance of that plan. Understand, in the middle of the murder spree, the middle of it, Starkweather and Fugate are driving for several hours toward Washington State. It's when Starkweather realizes that they don't have enough money to fully make the trip that they come back to Lincoln, Nebraska and kill more people as part of a home robbery. Right? So, let me back up. Let's go back to 
This January 21st, 1958. Let's talk about Carol Fugate's version of events. Understand, folks, this version has not changed. Understand this version is her version because she gives it before she's allowed legal representation. Right? She's at school. She's a 14-year-old at school. She arrives home. Her boyfriend, Charles Starkweather, is already there. Her parents are not. Her two-year-old half-sister is not. Starkweather tells her at the empty home that her parents are safe, her family is safe, but that she has to follow his lead. She has to do what he says. For her family to be released safely. Now keep in mind, two days earlier, Fugate had told Starkweather that the relationship was over. Right? That they were no longer going out together. So when she shows up at the house, it's not her boyfriend, Charles Starkweather. It's her ex-boyfriend. Charles Starkweather. Right? She's being stalked. Right? It's not her man. It's her ex. He's in her house. Everyone else is missing. She's told she has to follow his lead. For everyone to be safe. Right? Now, according to 14-year-old Fugate, they don't have sex. They don't. Starkweather has her post a note that everyone in the family has the flu. Right? Post a note out front to get visitors to leave them alone. They're in the house for six days. Six days. Right? Then, People come by, right, during that six days. They see the note. Fugate tells them, <coughs> yeah, everyone's sick. <coughs> come back later. Right? After six days, her and Starkweather leave the house. Then the spree starts. Understand, according to Fugate, she shoots no one. She's with Starkweather for the simple reason that she feels she's protecting her family. Right? Starkweather talks about having a gang. Keep in mind, this is a guy who, right, she had already tried to break up with because she thought he might be crazy. So here she is with her crazy ex-boyfriend who she's trying to dump. And he's claiming that some gang has her family. And that she has to follow his lead. And everyone will be safe. That's been her story from day one. Now here's the first big piece of evidence or lack of evidence that you should be aware of, right? Starkweather has a different story, right? Starkweather claims that Fugate's at the house when he kills her family, right? Understand, in terms of the family, right it's violent his mother is shot in the face right the father is shot in the head 
The father is also stabbed. The two-year-old is bludgeoned with the butt of the rifle after having her throat slit. Right? You shoot someone with a shotgun indoors. If you don't clean it up, if someone else is there, wouldn't there be blood everywhere? You have three different victims. You take the butt of a rifle and you use it to bash in the head of a two-year-old. Wouldn't there be blood everywhere? Right? Bullet hits mom's face. You would imagine there should be brain splatter. You would imagine the body would fall someplace. There'd be blood on the floor. Wouldn't the presence of blood splatter in the house, given Fugate's admission that she's in the house for six days, discredit any contention that Fugate had? that she didn't know that murders had taken place at her house. If you're a prosecutor, wouldn't the blood splatter be one of the first pieces of evidence that you would present to a jury? Wouldn't the argument be, Fugay shows up, her house is a bloody mess. How could the rest of her story be true? How could anyone at that point say, hey, ignore the brain matter that's on the wall here. Ignore the holes in the wall. Understand, you take out a rifle, you shoot someone, that bullet has to go someplace. Right? Your family is safe. The story wouldn't be credible. Fugate would be discredited. But yet the trial record shows absolutely no evidence of blood splatter. None. None. The prosecution never introduces any evidence of blood splatter. Right? Just understand that. In seeking the death penalty, the prosecution does not present blood splatter evidence that could have discredited Fugate's story, if the story could be discredited. Now, there's a lot of folklore after this case, but understand trials have trial transcripts. The trial transcripts don't contain blood splatter evidence. They don't. Let's go one step further. The bodies of her family were not found in the house. Right? The father is dumped in a chicken coop. The mother and daughter are dumped in the toilet of the outhouse, right? They're not in the house. All of the bodies were taken out of the house. So when Fugate comes home and sees her ex-boyfriend there alone, Right? Understand, there's nobody else there. And there's no evidence of blood splatter. Anything else is speculation. You can't convict someone, in my opinion, of murder on this evidence and give them a life sentence. Right? Now, let me say this. On January 27th, 1958, 
they leave the house. Fugate has been there with Starkweather for six days. Of course, Starkweather, in a self-serving story, claims that they were having sex. That this was the best time of his life. Right? Of course, understand this is Starkweather's later version of events. Starkweather then claims that Fugate played a major role in the beating of her half-sister. Right? Fugate places, excuse me, Starkweather places Fugate at the house and wants us to believe that as he's blowing away Fugate's mother and father, that Fugate somehow is involved in killing her two-year-old half-sister. Right? Now let me say this. When they leave the house, they travel 20 miles. They leave town. They go to Bennett, Nebraska. Now the first place they go, and this is important, right? Because Fugate claims she didn't want to be with Starkweather who's older than her by five years, right? The first place they go isn't to an associate or friend of Carol Ann Fugate. It's not. You ask yourself, what's the purpose of them being on the road? Who are they visiting? The first person they visit is August Meyer, 70 years old, who of course, was a family friend of Charles Starkweather. Starkweather's dad used to hunt with him. Right? Just think victimology. Fugate doesn't know the man. Fugate would have no incentive of going to this man's house, which isn't next door. It's 20 miles away. Who knows this man who lives in Bennett, Nebraska, 20 miles away? Not Fugate, but Charles Starkweather. He's the one calling the shots. Right? Starkweather claims Meyer meets him at the door with a shotgun. Meyer ultimately gets shot by Starkweather in the back of the head. Starkweather then robs the house. Right? This is the second murder committed by Starkweather that involves a robbery. Right? Now here's where it gets a little provocative. On that day, Starkweather brings the car to a gas station. Starkweather goes inside the gas station to talk with the mechanics outside the presence of Carol Ann Fugate. There's a food area. Fugate walks into the food area. <clears throat> right? Fugate orders four hamburgers. There's a 30-year-old waitress behind the counter. There are three or four men within close proximity. Fugate is there by herself. At no time does Fugate ask for help. At no time does Fugate tell anyone that she's being held hostage. Right? Starkweather then walks in to the food area, gives Fugate a 10. Fugate then turns and gives that $10. And keep in mind, this is $10 in the 1950s. This is an amount of coin here. Gives the $10 bill to the waitress. Now the waitress senses something is wrong, right? 
The waitress is a little disconcerted by how long Fugate looks at her. Right? The waitress senses that Fugate is staring at her a bit longer than usual. This is in a detective police report. Right? Now, you're a 14-year-old girl. Who are you going to seek help from in the diner that's filled with adult men? Is it the waitress? Why would Fugate stare at the waitress for some period of time? Why didn't Fugate motion to one of the men there or slip a note to the waitress saying, look, I'm a hostage here. This is a hostage situation. Right? She has a moment away from Starkweather. Also, the $10. What's the source of that? Now, we know seven weeks earlier, Charles Starkweather got $100 when he killed the gas station attendant. $100. We also know Starkweather's fully employed. Right? He has a job. He's a garbage man. Right? Just understand that those who want to believe that Fugate is guilty will say she didn't reach out to anyone at the diner during those moments. They'll even say, had Starkweather already killed a man in her presence? When exactly did Starkweather kill August Meyer? The point here, though, is we don't know. This scene can be interpreted two ways. If this is pre-murder, right, if it's pre-murder, then Fugate wouldn't have known that her family had been killed and removed from her home. She would have just been on a trip 20 miles away with Starkweather and would have stopped in this gas station slash diner. Right? She would be with an ex-boyfriend who she might not know is a killer or is capable of killing. She may have thought, okay, look, I'm breaking up with the guy, but I don't want to get him in legal trouble. She wouldn't have known what was ahead of her. She may have been in the diner, looked at the waitress, right? The waitress was disconcerted by how long she looked at the waitress. She may have pondered the thought of, hey, should I reach out to this older woman and tell her, hey, look, you know, I'm a hostage here. And she may have thought to herself, you know what, my ex has problems. He doesn't need to be arrested for kidnapping. He'll let my parents go, and then I'll be able to get back on with my life, and then he can move on with his. I don't think this is dispositive either way. Right? We don't know whether 70-year-old August Meyer had been killed by the time she is in this diner. Without that information, I don't think we can reach conclusions. Well, here's what happens. That day, and let's be clear on the day here. It's January... It's January 27th, 1958. That day, which is six days after Fugate arrives home from school and sees her ex in her house, right? This is 20 miles away from Lincoln, Nebraska. That day, August Meyer is dead, right? He's killed by Starkweather, and he was a Starkweather family friend. Understand, at some time in that day, they take their car to this gas station to get it worked upon. Understand, their car stalls out. On the road, two teenagers, two Bennett, Nebraska teenagers, then see Starkweather and his girl on the road, stranded, right, walking along the side of the road. 
they pick them up. They're good Samaritans. They see a couple of stranded people. They pick them up to give them a lift. These two people are 17-year-old Robert Jensen and 16-year-old Carol King. Now here's where it gets important. Right? We know one person is dead on the spree. Right? While Fugate is with Starkweather. Right? And that's August Meyer. Fugate's family is dead, but Fugate's claiming she didn't know about that. Right? Now here's where the case pivots. Starkweather forces Jensen and King to drive through an abandoned to drive to an abandoned storm cellar. He forces them down the stairs. He shoots the guy in the back of the head. He then spends 20 minutes in the cellar with 16-year-old Carol King. According to Starkweather, <clears throat> when he comes out of the cellar and goes to the car, and it's late and it's cold, it's winter in Nebraska, it's January in Nebraska, right? Fugate's in the car, in the middle of nowhere, right? In the cold. When he gets back to the car, Starkweather claims that Fugate was livid, that he was down there for 20 extra minutes with the woman. According to Starkweather, he left the woman alive. Fugate's irate. Fugate grabs a gun. <clears throat> Fugate then goes down to the storm cellar. Right? Starkweather then hears a gunshot. When Carol King's body is discovered, she has been vaginally mutilated, stabbed up, right? Fugate claims that that murder, excuse me, Starkweather claims that that murder was done by Fugate. Fugate, of course, claims that she didn't kill this woman, that her involvement with these two was that in the car at the behest of Starkweather, because she's a hostage of Starkweather. Starkweather had her point a gun at Jensen and took $4 out of his wallet. That's the level of her involvement. She admits to this at trial. She claims she was forced to do it. Right? She admits that she pointed a gun at the guy and took four dollars from his wallet right you're the observer just ask yourself if there's evidence here beyond a reasonable doubt to believe Starkweather who up until now is not leaving anyone alive who can identify him Right? Kills her family, kills August Meyer. Do you believe Starkweather in front of this woman would kill her boyfriend, shoot him in the back of the head, and then would leave her alive? Let me ask you too. What do you think happened in the 20 minutes after Starkweather kills her boyfriend? and is in the room alone with this woman. What do you think they discussed? What do you think they did? What do you think happened in those 20 minutes? And if you believe something bad happened in those 20 minutes, why would Starkweather leave her alive? This is after he had already killed the gas station attendant. 
Fugate's parents, Fugate's two-year-old half-sister, August Meyer, her boyfriend. Fugate, uh, Starkweather's already killed six people. Why would he leave number seven alive to be killed by Carol Ann Fugate? Think about it. Right? So, understand, after this storm cellar situation, right, they literally are on the way out of town. They're on their way to Washington State. They drive for more than an hour in the direction of Washington State. Then they realize they need more money. So what do they do? They turn the car around. Right now they're driving Robert Jensen's car. They turn the car around. And on January 29th, 1958, they go to the home of a wealthy Lincoln businessman, C. Lauer Ward. Now, this killing is one you need to really pay attention to. Understand they arrive at the house while Mr. Ward is out at work at 8.30 in the morning, 8.30 a.m. They encounter his wife, Carol Ward, and their deaf maid, right, Lillian Finkel. Now understand, Starkweather holds them hostage all day, right? Starkweather and Fugate are there from 8.30 a.m. to around 6 p.m. when the husband returns home from work. In other words, Starkweather who Fugate claims is holding him hostage, successfully holds other people hostage for several hours during the spree. Right, several people hostage. Understand Starkweather seems to have had the ability, right, he's holding a gun, to first have Carol King and Robert Jensen, two people, in a storm cellar, right together holds them hostage kills the guy then spends 20 minutes with the woman right the next day Starkweather is holding Carol Ward and her maid Lillian hostage for several hours in their own house right nobody calls the police Understand Starkweather seems to have been adept at managing hostage situations. Now let me say this. The deaths are violent. Even though Starkweather has guns, has bullets, the wife and maid are brutally stabbed. When the husband comes home, he's shot in the back. Right, Starkweather then steals his expensive Packard car. Right, and of course, with Fugate present, he heads off to Washington State again. The purpose of the Ward killings of three people, the husband, wife, and maid, is to rob the house. It's the same motive for Starkweather's first killing. Right? It's the same motive for Starkweather's killing of August Meyer. Right? After he kills a 70-year-old, he ransacks the house, takes money. It's the same motive for them taking money out of the wallet of Bob Jensen. It's the same motive here. 
Starkweather is killing for money to finance a trip to Washington State with the woman he loves. So they cross state borders. They go to Wyoming. Starkweather is nervous here because the car he's driving is a bit too expensive. It stands out. A Packard back then is like a very expensive car today. You don't want the cops looking for you, and here you are in an easily recognizable car. Right? People turn around and they say, hey, who's that guy in the Ferrari or whatever? Right? Who's the guy in the Tesla? Right? So, Starkweather decides that they need to change cars when they get to Wyoming. So they come upon a guy who's sleeping in his car. Starkweather takes out his gun and shoots the man nine times. Right? This is yet another murder for money. Right? Or for things like a car. In other words, it's a murder to help him get to Washington State. That's his end game. He's not just killing these people, he's killing these people for a purpose. Right? To escape to Washington State with the woman he loves. So understand, after he shoots up this guy and gets in the car, he can't get the brake off the car. He doesn't know how. It's when a neighbor comes by, right, a good Samaritan, and sees Starkweather struggling with the car that Starkweather takes out the gun, wants to get this neighbor away from him. The two men struggle. Police are alerted. The cops come over. Fugate immediately runs to the police. Fugate, and keep in mind, this is well before, she has an opportunity to talk to a lawyer. Fuge tells the cops, hey, I'm a hostage. Please, save me. She immediately does that. When else, during the spree, did she have access to law enforcement? When else? So understand, Starkweather then gets the car to work. He takes off. Right? They didn't surrender together. Starkweather at this point tries to get away. A high-speed chase ensues. At high speeds. Right? Possibly over a hundred miles an hour. It's only when the cops shoot at the car while in pursuit of Starkweather and the bullet nicks Starkweather's ear. That Starkweather pulls over to the side of the road and surrenders. Right? That's what happened. Now I've watched shows like Deadly Women with one of my personal heroes, Candace DeLong. And they wrongly portray how these two are apprehended. Understand, Fugate runs to the police, right? Says, hey, help me, save me. Runs to the police. Starkweather takes off in the car and has to be pursued by police. That's how it comes to an end. So understand, after all of this, Starkweather says to the police she didn't have anything to do with it. Right? I was the one who did all of the murders. That's his story. Until the prosecution leans on a 14-year-old who's not represented by counsel before she gets representation that they know's coming to write a letter that gets Starkweather to change his story. 
Now let's talk about some key points. I see the videos running way too long. Right? Some key points for you to consider. First, and I know they're conflicting reports, but why does the trial transcript for Carol Fugate and for Starkweather show a complete absence of blood evidence at the Fugate family home? Right? Understand, if Fugate shows up at the house and it's bloody, she can't claim she didn't know her parents were killed. Right? So understand, there's an absence. There's an absence of testimony, of evidence, of blood splatter at the house. Right? There's nothing to discredit. Fugate's contention that she was in the house for six days and reasonably thought her family was safe. Right? Let me say this too. There's a counter argument. You hear that your family is safe and that if you do what an ex-boyfriend wants you to do, they'll be released. If you're present then during several murders, do you continue to hold on to that belief? Let me say, though, that the argument has a timing problem, doesn't it? Right? Fugate would have had that belief, right, for the six days. Because during those six days, she didn't see anybody get murdered. Then, of course, when they go on their road trip, right, Fugate might have believed that the fact that they were leaving town would have enabled her family to be released, right? That the family was now farther away from stark weather, right? So I believe we have a lot of after the fact arguments that don't fit the timelines of the crime. She may even have believed that Starkweather, who, as far as she knew, had never murdered before, was getting increasingly violent, but was not violent on the front end. Right? Let me, uh, let me say this, too. Visitors came to the house. The visitors had no indication from when they showed up at the house that anyone had been killed. In other words, there's nothing on the exterior of the house that would indicate that anyone had been killed. Right? No one noticed anything strange. Understand, the victims are moved to a different building, right? Outhouse. The visitors didn't have any suspicion or awareness that anything strange was going on in the outhouse. If the visitors to the house during the six days didn't sense that something was amiss, why would Fugate have? Right? Just, uh, you know, food for thought. Let me say this too. Starkweather initially told the cops that he shot everyone in self-defense, right? Understand his later versions of events don't match his earlier versions of events. If there's someone not to be believed here, wouldn't it be Charles Starkweather, who's admitting to having killed before, right, his first murder, right, and who literally is taking the couple to family friends to murder them, people Fugate didn't know. Let me say this too. Another key point is the couple's agenda really is Starkweather's agenda, isn't it? 
Why are they in Bennett, Nebraska? Why do they leave Lincoln? It's to go to his family's friend's place. Think about that. Right? Not Fugate's friend, his family's friend's place. What's in Washington State their ultimate destination? Not anyone Fugate knows, but a member of Starkweather's family. Right? The agenda they're pursuing, the person financing the trip, the person who pays for the car repairs, the person who pays for the couple's food at the diner, is Charles Starkweather. Now, some people go so far as to say that Starkweather, if you could believe this, passed the lie detector test as to his eighth or ninth version of events. Right? Well, first, let me state the obvious. Starkweather is a sociopath. He lacks empathy. If anyone is not going to have an emotional response that would trigger a lie detector test, it would be a sociopath like Charles Starkweather. More importantly, Fugate claims she asked for a lie detector test when she was arrested. She asked for one. The prosecution refused. So years later, when she gets out of prison, she contacts the show, Lie Detector, a show that was done by praised criminal defense attorney F. Lee Bailey. Right? Think about it. Big time lawyer. Big time lawyer. Nationally televised show. She undergoes a lie detector test twice and passes both times. If you're going to play the Starkweather lie detector test, please mention Fugate's successful lie detectors. By the way, an experienced F. Lee Bailey is involved in Fugate's lie detector test on a show centered around reading and interpreting lie detector test results. We don't know the circumstances under which Starkweather passed his lie detector test, now do we? Right? And so the point of this is simply that you have a sociopath who's killed before. Right? Literally with a much younger girlfriend who has steadfastly maintained that this sociopath lied to her about the safety of her family and threatening to hurt her family had her on the run with him. Right? We know the places they went to were his idea because the first place they went to was his family friend who he killed. Right? We know that the first time Fugate had an opportunity to interact with police she did so and said, hey, I'm a hostage. Right? Understand, if you look at the timeline of everything that happened, it's over fast. Right? There's six days where they're at Fugate's house. Fugate at that point may not have seen any killing whatsoever. Right? There's no evidence that she saw any blood splatter. They then leave the house on January 27th, 1958. Understand Starkweather is arrested two days later on January 29th, 1958. There's a spatial dimension to this. People want to know, hey, you're with this guy. Why couldn't you have ran to freedom? Right? Other people are saying, hey, Fugate is in her town. Why couldn't she have found a way to run to freedom? Understand, she's only in her town the first six days. Right? She would believe that her parents are in a hostage situation. They leave Lincoln. 
she's 14, they're 20 miles away, visiting Starkweather's friend, right? She then sees Starkweather kill someone for the first time. Is it that much of a reach for one to argue that Fugate couldn't jump out the car on the highway between Lincoln and Bennett on the 20-mile trip up there? Is it that much of a reach to believe that Fugate was startled a fish out of water when she goes into the diner as Charles is getting the car worked on? where Fugate stares at the waitress according to the waitress for too long. Is it too much of a reach to believe that Fugate at that point was wondering what her exit strategy would be? Keep in mind, we don't know if anyone's killed. She doesn't know if anyone's killed when she goes in the diner because Meyer may have been killed after that. Now it turns ugly late at night with the two teenagers down in the storm cellar. But it's cold in Nebraska. This is winter in Nebraska. It's January in Nebraska. They're out in the middle of nowhere. Right? As Starkweather's down in the cellar with these two. If Fugate opens the car door and runs out into the darkness, where does she go? She's seen Starkweather kill a man earlier, earlier that day. She may have heard the gunshot when Starkweather was down in the storm cellar with these two. She may have foolishly believe that the first killing of a Starkweather family friend was personal, that Starkweather had something against August Meyer, and that Starkweather was bringing these two to the storm cellar simply to tie them up. Why would Starkweather go to a storm cellar if he's just going to kill them? Since they were out late at night in the middle of nowhere, why wouldn't Starkweather just shoot the two of them, leave them on the side of the road? Right, she may have then heard the gunshot and may have realized this guy's a big killer. May have thought he could come out of the storm cellar at any time. Right, if you're out in a flatland and you jump out of a car, you can run some distance and somebody else will still be able to see you. Right, understand after the storm cellar, they leave. They're driving to Washington State. Again, not anywhere Fugate is familiar with. Right? Charles is the one who knows how to drive. Not the 14-year-old. Right? Then, Charles decides to double back to Lincoln. Right? How do we know that Fugate didn't convince him to double back to Lincoln? their hometown, in an effort to try to find a way to escape at that time. Understand, too, when Charlie then holds the wealthy family hostage for several hours, don't you get the feeling that Charles was adept at that, given the fact that he was able to also manipulate the young couple who he killed in the storm cellar, right? Hasn't Charles shown an ability to subdue multiple people with his firearms? If the maid couldn't get away, if the woman couldn't get away, if the husband who comes home from work couldn't get away, why should we believe that Fugate could get away? Right? Also, you know, I know people say, hey, this happened over several days, right? Literally, two days, two days after they leave the house, Starkweather gets arrested. The first time in those two days, 
that Fugate has access to the police, she runs over to them. Right? Says, hey, I'm a hostage here. I've been kidnapped, basically. Right? So, based on this evidence against a 14-year-old, I don't understand how there could be a conviction for murder. This 14-year-old seems to have been the one person to maintain the same story throughout. You're going to convict her based on the changing story of a sociopath who admits that he killed someone before all this started. Right? You're going to convict her based on the words of the guy who was driving them around the place. She's a passenger, folks. She can't just hop out of the car. Right? Not only that, you know, just ask yourself. If Starkweather is killing everyone he encounters, right? Take the guy who happens to be sleeping in his car. We know Starkweather wants the car. Starkweather shows up, immediately shoots him. Why should any of us believe Starkweather? Keep in mind, he only implicates her in one murder, right? He, he only says that she committed one murder herself. And it's a woman we're supposed to believe Starkweather leaves alive after killing her man and after spending 20 minutes with this woman? Right? I, you know, let's just do a timeline too. Am I supposed to believe that Starkweather leaves a 16-year-old woman in a storm cellar alive? Right? And that his 14-year-old then is able to go downstairs shoot this woman and then would have an interest in mutilating her vaginally who's more likely to have mutilated this poor victim vaginally sociopath Charles Starkweather or his 14 year old girlfriend who keep in mind isn't the one driving isn't the one who killed the boyfriend I just find Starkweather's story to be not credible and keep in mind Starkweather's story is not the first story he had his version keeps changing let me also say this too why would Starkweather change his version of the events understand Starkweather didn't want to be put to death that's another myth right because Starkweather himself kept filing papers to have his sentence commuted that's part of the public record, right? Stark Mether may have believed that by cooperating with authorities, changing his story, literally changing his story to try to incriminate Carol Ann Fugate, to put her on death row, Stark Mether may have believed that he would save his life or conversely, since Fugate was the love of his life, Starkweather may have believed that if they were both put to death, they would both be together in the afterlife. Right? And so based on these facts, I consider Fugate's conviction to be a travesty. Let me hear from you. I know there are many people out there who've avidly followed this case. Understand, Fugate actually gets paroled after 18 years in prison, right? I believe the state of Nebraska knows something was wrong with this conviction. Because if you believe Fugate had a hand in the murders of her parents, if you believe Fugate is so depraved that she would be involved in the murder of her, her two-year-old half-sister, if you believe Fugate is so depraved that she would participate in a string of murders that include things like the killing of a 70-year-old, the vaginal mutilation of a 16-year-old, right, the killing of a husband, wife, and their maid, right, the shooting of, you know, a dog, right, if you believe all of that, then she would hardly be someone who 
you would grant parole to after 18 years. Understand, her sentence is commuted down to 30 years, and then she ultimately gets parole. Right? So I believe people know mistakes were made here. I believe for legal reasons. You know, governors and others did not give this woman a pardon. But it's an outrage. Think about the 14-year-olds you know. Just ask yourself, who was the one calling the shots? Right today, why wouldn't Fugate, who contends she broke up with Starkweather two days earlier, why wouldn't Fugate be viewed as a battered woman? Do the forensics even match Starkweather's story? Right? If Starkweather uses a shotgun to kill Fugate's parents and bludgeons the kid to death, wouldn't there be blood all over that murder scene? Why would a prosecution ignore that evidence if it existed? I don't even think the forensics match Starkweather's changed story. And most importantly, for civil libertarians like us, or at least like me. How could we sit by while the state gets a 14-year-old who's unrepresented by counsel to write a letter to Charles Starkweather saying, hey, I never want to see you again so that he changes his story and that changed story is the basis of her conviction. That'd be an outrage today. Just imagine if you heard of a case like this. That'd be an outrage today. How was it allowed to happen in Nebraska in the 1950s? Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at richarddwyer.com for my law firm and, of course, at gamblersadvisory.com for sports talk. Thanks for stopping by.